The following interview was conducted with Lloyd D. Nearer, Professor Emeritus of Inductive Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, December 2nd, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Dr. Derrick. My pleasure. Thank Let's you start with, tell us where you were born and your parents in early years, grade yeah. school. Well, I was born in Clinton County, Frankfurt, Clinton County Hospital. In Frankfurt? In Frankfurt, Indiana. Okay. And my what year were you born in? 1931. Okay. July. July 10th, in fact. And uh, my father had been a sawmill operator, as had his father. And as I was going to put it back into history, that's where they moved over and started running sawmills and things of this sort, and it passed it through the, down through the line. So uh, when I was about three, two or three years old, Dad and Mom moved, moved to Mulberry. They bought a, uh, the one that they'd had, inherited when my grandfather died, died the year before I was born. He had a beautiful sawmill in Frankfurt, Noblesville, and also in Florida, Orlando, where they, today the Disney World is down there. And uh, hmm. my dad then bought the one in Mulberry. When we moved, we moved to Mulberry then in the house down there, and he ran the sawmill then. And, until 1950, and uh, all the years I was growing up there, I went to Mulberry High School, graduated in 1949. What was high school? Like? Were there any student clubs that you belonged to? No, or? I didn't. Oh. I didn't. Was it a large high I, school? Or? No, very, very small. I only had uh, 15 members of my graduating class. My wife to be was, was a be year behind me in school, and her father was a principal and teacher as well. And she had nine when they graduated, and one boy. And when they graduated on stage, or four girls on one side, and four girls, he transferred in from some other school, so there was just a one boy in her class. That was it. <laughs> so we had a small school. Any, and there very any? few uh, students from our school went on to college. A few did, but not very many. What and about I athletics? Was there any kind of athletics? Basketball. That was king, just like Milan. And we all thought of Milan. We all thought, when we heard about Milan winning, of course, that, that was wonderful because I set back class basketball 20 years. but. We all, everybody had their dreams that we could all win the state, you know, and most of them, my dad was a firm believer, of course he went to Frankfurt High School, as did mother, and Everett Case was the star of the coach at that time, he won three championships in Indiana in basketball, so dad was a very, didn't play, but was a very, good not, supporter, oh, very good supporter of it, very quiet supporter, I mean, he didn't scream, he yelled at the games in all the years I played, I played four, four years in high school, and enjoyed it, that was, everything was broke for the basketball, but did not intend to go to college, my wife was going to go, we started dating early, and uh, she was a principal's daughter, so we had to read toe the line. And uh, <laughs> that was very interesting. And, oh, yeah. Uh, that must be it. Went to the high school where my dad, my father was the principal. Yeah. You did, too. And it's a small school, so people, everybody would know. Oh, yeah. And you couldn't do it. I mean, you couldn't. She had to be just, very, you know, they were very strict. Her father was a very, very strict principal, a good principal, very, very strict. And every school year was a principal of, he said, boy, look out, because he is strict. And you'd go out in the halls there, you didn't hear anything. You'd walk down the halls, it was quiet. Because if it wasn't, you'd find out real fast. And they had good discipline, teachers had discipline, whether you liked it or not, they had it. Sure. And uh, that's just the way it was. Sure, I understand. And, uh, but I liked her when she was first, when her, first, her dad became principal. Uh, I, she was in the first grade when I came to become principal, and I was in second grade. And I kind of liked her then, believe it or not, and walking on through the years. And so we grew up together all through grade school, high school. and. Uh, Never intended to go to college or go work with my dad in his own in coal yard. That's why he didn't brought in a coal business to help supplement the sawmill because it was beginning to wane then. And so I worked in the sawmill and had a truck and drove my dad, and that was all I was going to do. No future in that, but I didn't think about that. I was shooting baskets all the time. That's all we were dreaming about. Didn't intend to go to college. I had the job lined up with dad, and that's what he wanted, and never thought anything about that. Did and you have any brothers or sisters? Or you no, my brother, oh, I had one brother who died three years before I was born. Oh, okay. And he had <coughs> Might have been a crib death situation. He was born, the mother called it a blue baby when he was born. That's what she called it. I don't know what. Uh, we never could find anything out about it. I tried finding records and, and we never could find any, any information on what caused it for sure. But this, that's what she always said. He was real when he was born and he uh, went to bed one night and woke up and stayed the next day. So and she never really got over that. It was a very mm -hmm. dramatic thing. They lived in a farm at the time. And, uh, you never do. No, you never do. And, uh, well, then and she had ill health quite a bit and had heart problems for herself. And uh, it wasn't until my senior year in high school that I'd never been hurt in anything at all. I played basketball, everything was going great. I'd never been going to work with Dad, and he's the year behind me as a junior. And uh, my senior year in February, I got hit in the face with an elbow, and knocked the cheekbone out, and crushed the eye socket. Didn't know I was ever going to see again. I was out of school for almost a month. And uh, the surgery was done here in the Lafayette Home Hospital, believe it or not, by my uncle's best friend, my uncle, or my uh, best friend's uncle. 
Dr. Martin Harshman, who worked at the RNA clinic. Dr. Dr. Dan Busker, there weren't many doctors around. And he said, and I'd known him from time, he was from my little kid, but he's running around the best man. We go to the lake and he was always out there fishing and whatever. And so I didn't know what to do. I couldn't see out of the right eye now. I didn't know what's going to happen. So I was hospitalized and they did the surgery. And he put the face back together and didn't operate on the outside of my face like they most often did. And he went up inside, performed the surgery, reconstructed the cheekbone, reconstructed the eye socket. Wasn't sure whether they had any vision out of it or not. Came back 2020. I had muscle control to develop, but I couldn't read so often. So, uh, but unfortunately, my mother had a real problem when she saw me. She mentally just couldn't take it at the time. So, Dad had both of us in hospital for a while. And but that injury, two things: that injury and dating Louise, my wife to be, changed my life forever. How's that? Because had it, had it not been for her encouraging me, because I now I couldn't play ball anymore. That day's over. So I had to decide, well, she said, well, why don't you get your health back? Because I lost 20 pounds in hospital over a month's time. And so she said, you know, we can, if you let it work for your dad a year, we can go to college together. And I said, I'm not qualified. I, you know, I'd taken all the wrong subjects. I had not prepared to go to college at that time. I hadn't taken the math, the science, and all the other things that was necessary. I was just concerned about playing basketball and taking courses that enabled me to do that. But I loved and I loved the shop, what they call farm agriculture shops, what they call it in those days. Loved that. Made all kinds of furniture, which we still have to this day. And really did enjoy that. I loved music and art and all those kinds of things. And I loved, of course, all the physical ed classes. Loved those things. Music, loved music. Played the drums in high school, band, orchestra, and so on. But it was interesting because uh, I did, I got a, came back to school and my grades were just mediocre at best. I, I wasn't worried because I wasn't going to college. As long as I got decent grades to graduate and get my diploma, great. That's all I was concerned about, you know. Like a lot of kids were in the country schools in those days, but not many kids went to college. Very few out of our class ever did. So when I came back to school, after I was gone, about a month, her mother, because my mother was still hospitalized and I couldn't go to school because I couldn't focus my eyes yet. So her mother, the principal's wife, took me to her house during the daytime because dad had to work and nobody was with me at home. I couldn't be by myself. So I stayed with Mrs. Jones and she nursed me back at home during the daytime and she taught me. She'd been a teacher herself. And so she taught me how to outline, how to study books and she'd read the stuff and check and make sure I was getting how to outline the material once I got so I could focus things a little bit better. When I got back to school finally, back in the classes again, all my grades in every class went up to A's and B's from that point forward. So that one incident changed my whole life, and I didn't. And I decided, well, maybe I can go to school. I can do these things after all. But I never really applied myself until that happened. And then I really got to study, studying, learning how to study, which she taught her mother taught me how to do. And so then I did do that. I worked a whole year for my dad, drove the truck, and that was an eye opener because I could see things in far differently when I came out. Maybe that experience, that blow to the head, maybe it was a wake up call. Who knows? So I decided, well, maybe I can go. And she graduated. And we applied to colleges to go to become a teacher. You could become a teacher. So I love you know, shop and industrial arts course. I thought shop was woodworking. That's all I thought I was. I didn't know it involved all these other subjects along with it. That was the biggest eye opener when I went to school you could imagine. And so it was, it was ironic. Uh, we applied and went to the teacher's college, Ball State Teacher's College. That's a good college, good reputation. Her dad knew about the different colleges and applications and things. And so I studied and got home and her mother had all these different tests that you could take and practice on. So I worked and worked and diligently and tried to learn how to write and put things together and make some sense out of it. And we did go to Ball State. It was the greatest experience I ever had in my life. And I loved, I really loved being in college. You lived right on campus. You weren't they, married at that time. No, we were not. Or, no, we wanted to be, but her parents said there's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> we dated three years was in high school. Any, did you get any financial assistance None. at all? No, she did. She was on scholarship. She was an excellent student. Okay. She was on scholarship. And I was just hoping and praying I could get admitted so I could, so I could just, just pass these courses and do things. And, uh, Did you live on campus I then? lived on campus. Well, well, tell us a little about college then. What was it? Uh, it was a small campus. I think about 1,000 to 1,500 students when we were there at that time, all teacher education primary. That was, it was just called Ball State Teachers College at that time. So that was the main focus. And then, of course, Burris Lab School was right across the street. Of course, they did all kinds of uh, teaching and trying out different ideas in lab school with the students there. And it's like a college prep in, in, that, in that regard, uh, an excellent place. And then the School of Nursing, uh, Ball Memorial Hospital, right down from Burris Lab School. So we got a chance to observe teachers and see what's going on right across the street and try to see new methods being tried out. And I was very fortunate in the industrial arts department at the time I was there. 
wonderful staff. They had one professor, Dr. Will Allen, my favorite professor of all time I've ever had. Because he taught more in his class as a young man, came from Oswego College in New York. But he, his classes were so well organized and so well prepared. You knew the first day you walked into class, every assignment was expected, when it was due, what was expected, right? And he had his syllabus, everything prepared. I patterned my own teaching styles exactly after him. All of them here. You knew from day one he was organized. Oh, absolutely. The most, most organized, efficient teacher I've ever known in my life. And we, the things he had us do that were so important were things you as a teacher of industrial arts were going to do when you got there. And he had us doing, looking at books and finding out what books were appropriate for junior high school or high school age students. And you'd go to the library and search books and do make a bibliography and things of this sort to find out what books would be appropriate for that. And he had us make, putting up bulletin boards. This was in his first class I took him. Now, usually, and this is where we, <laughs> interesting story will come later, because uh, he made each class, not only was it teaching you how to do woodworking or metalworking or machine shop or whatever classes he had to be teaching, you were getting that content as well. But you, he also included methodology along with his teaching, so he had you making out lesson plans, even though we were freshman students. And you normally think that at Purdue is just the opposite. We did that our final semester. You're here. Now you're going to be a teacher. We're going to make you get all the content the first four or five years you're here. Now we're going to make a teacher last semester. I never agreed with that philosophy. I still don't. I, but, but I was taught the other way. And In those days, his, that's interesting. Oh, you know, he was way ahead of his time, I think. And, and he realized, he gave us a sample of lesson plans so we could pattern ours after, the, after a sheet. And it was organized this way and objectives and so on weren't like they are. There weren't behavioral objectives like they are today. But the idea was to get you familiar with being a teacher early on. If you're going to be a teacher, let's see whether you, whether you want to do that or not. Do it your first. Why wait till your senior year and they find out, oh boy, if I knew it was going to be like this, I wouldn't be a teacher, which I encountered when I became a teacher and professor at Purdue time and time again. And that's how our industrial technology program moved from purely a teacher education program to we had a manufacturing option within our teacher education because the seniors suddenly go, listen, I don't want to teach school. I like the program, but I'm not going to teach school. Well, then why do we make them take teacher education courses if they're not going to go there in the first place? Why wait to that final semester? So ultimately, we did change our program in Purdue uh, to do that and accommodate that. Well, he was doing that way back then. So the students weren't, didn't think about wanting to be a teacher. They found out early. You found out the first or second semester. First of all, it was in quarter system then. First or second quarter, you knew right away, well, I don't like this. I don't want to go to the library or make out lesson plans or grade papers. And he had to make out tests. Quizzes over what we had. We had just the day to day, which you would oh, be involved in. That's right, exactly. He had putting up bowling boards, giving lessons, giving demonstrations in class. We had to practice and learn how to do it. And, uh, and had us write a consumer report, take a prepare products or whatever you wanted on, on whatever was presented, whether some furniture or tools or whatever in his classes that he had. So I learned so much from him over the years. And I had it four times. you too, and you utilized it. Right, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I took him four times every time I got a chance to take him, I take him to look up and say, you in here again, near you must be a glutton for punishment. <laughs> he fitted me about that through the years. We became good friends. And uh, what a dynamic was there, Were there quite a few programs in the industrial uh, arts and, and in those days at Ball State? In Did terms of? Want, uh, pro, uh, those that want to major in that for teaching afterwards. We had quite a few teachers in there, in there you know, at the time I was there. Mm -hmm. who, uh, in fact, one the interesting, we, lived in the old Quonset huts, they call them, which was, Elliott Hall was here, Burroughs Lab School was over here, and, and we were sort of in between with Quonset huts they had left over, and so we had to stay in the Quonset huts because they had a big influx of some of the veterans from the Korean War was starting to feed back a little bit. It's still sort of going on, but there was some of them were coming back, going to school now in the GI Bill, but they housed all the industrial arts majors over in the, one of these rooms over the, uh, up and down this Quonset hut, up clean number of so they tried to carry up as much as they could that way, which is an interesting fact. did, and I do this with some of the athletic programs they put the basketball teams in some colleges, they don't all do that, but some colleges are put the, they have their own private dorms, the athletes in one area and so on. <laughs> some of the powerhouse <laughs> programs do that. I don't know whether they still do or not. I've, I've heard, heard rumors of that effect. <laughs> don't know what's fact or fact. I don't know what I've heard. Um, but it was fascinating. And uh, it, it's amazing the, the, the things you can learn and, and gain from those people. And, and you ask questions. And, and, uh, and then I, later on, I uh, tried to work my way through college because I hadn't prepared to save a lot of money, no scholarships. So I, Got a job right away. I bought a real mower and mowed yards in the neighborhood, or, or ten or fifteen dollars, and, and mowed the little yards around the campus for a while. Later on, I got a job as a uh, in the cafeteria, straggling place, and, and uh, the lady found out that I belonged to the Masonic Lodge. So right away, she saw my ring, and she immediately 
put me in the cashier, which I'd never been a cashier before, never anything like that before, but within three weeks I was now a cashier. And I had to take all the money underneath the streets from the Elliott Hall over to the women's the sign hall, which was underneath on the other side, through a dark tunnel, but money in the bank says, I know I can trust you. Well, that was a thrill. Because <laughs> I, I didn't know where the switch was for the tunnel sometimes, <laughs> and that turned out to be quite an experience. <laughs> I bet. That was something else. But I did that for a year, about a year, and then uh, they had a, te a technician's job open up in the industrial arts program itself where you'd be a lab assistant, and I applied for that and got it. And then for the last two years, I served as a lab assistant oh, to the great professor. Great experience. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity where I really learned about maintaining equipment, tools, and I had to set up the auto, they started an automotive program and uh, uh, Lloyd Nelson came on board later on to become the dean of the school and uh, we went into Epsom Pi Tau together when he came on board my senior year and I was his lab assistant as well and he taught me so many things in his office about just about life in general and being a teacher. A great friend to this day and a wonderful person. Good. And, uh, but that lab technician job really was a wonderful yeah. opportunity was for me. Boom. It was truly boom. was. Yeah. And I got to know the people really well and gained a lot of respect. Experience. Wonderful. Did you do any uh, what, uh, student teaching did you, in that area? Did you did my student teach at McKinley Junior High School, which oh. is uh, where they used to play the basket. It's a big field house, and they had industrial arts around the outside of it. So that was very, very interesting when I did my student teaching because I was taught taught all these methodologies at Ball State and how you should work with your students and things of this sort. And they put me at McKinley Junior High School. I met the two industrial arts teachers out there, one was in graphic arts and one was in uh, woodworking. And uh, the one I had, he, he, they also did the same background. I had the industrial arts teachers in physical education. That was my background. I made double majors in both. So I had the one man, although they both were industrial arts teachers, and the one that uh, I had PE for, his name was Reuben Merrill. And he was quite an interesting fellow, a unique way of speaking. And the first PE class I went into, 87 students in one class. This is a physical education class, and we were in the field house. And he, he said, no. <laughs> His first comment right out of the box is, I know what Ball State's teaching. He had a funny way of talking. He says, forget that. Now we're getting down to the real world. He says, I've got 87 students in here, and they came in for exercise, and that's what we're going to give them. What time do you have? So the first thing we had to do is get my watch out. We're synchronizing exactly the second. And he says, when we come in here, we're not going to ask them what they want to do. We're going to tell them this is what you're going to do. If they can't take part, they don't need to come to class. So, and now just the opposite of everything I've been taught at Ball State. <laughs> Ask the students what they'd like to do and how they want to participate and all this sort of thing. So, a little first, different philosophy. First thing out of the box, he comes in with all these students. He said, Can you imagine? And when you get out in front of that class, the first time you teach this class, don't say, Not today, boys, that's what we're going to do. Don't do that. <laughs> I had trouble keeping my face straight, but it was just the opposite of what I had been taught about asking students what they think about these things. We don't have time for that. We want to get these kids exercise. That's what they're here That's for. That's what right? they're here for, and we're going to give it to them. Now, when they come in here, he says, there's a series of cards. Now, your first assignment is take these cards and make a roll so you can do roll call. And we got them divided into squads, 10 boys to a squad. But the first thing, and they know that. So when they walk through that door, they run over there to get in their squad. They don't walk through the door. They run to get in those lineups. And they're standing there quietly, at attention. And the, and the kid who couldn't take part, he's going to take all those jewels. Jewelry, rings, whatever, watches, whatever they have, and he types that up here. And the first day I'm there, one young man says, Mr. Run, I thought, son, you don't think when you come to this class, you take part. Now, you know that. And stop before I ever got through the gym door. Shoot him out. You don't think. If you can't take part, you don't come to class. You go back to the principal's office. You know that. <laughs> I'm standing here looking at the four young kids, but he, tried, he wouldn't let him talk, you know. Had to drop right. So as soon as they walked through the door, my job was to take these cards and find out who the ten captains of each squad was, and they'd come up and yell their name, and I'd hand the card out to them. And I had to arrange all these students' names on here by cards. So this, all the student had to do is go out there and put a dot with a name. They look at the squad. He's either here, he's not here. We had ten minutes taken in less than ten seconds. Ten minutes were taken. On eighty-seven students, we had it all done. They rushed that thing over, turned the name towards the young man that, the, that was waiting at the, at the table at the entrance of the gym. To take that and put the sticker on the door, stick it like the turn to the princess. Oh, here's the students are in and out, just like that, organized to the hill. But I learned a lot about organization. You did. I did. Shape up or shape out. Oh, from the first day I had to take over the class. That was it. We were going to touch football one time. He says, "You know what? Touch football. Yeah, you know the rules about safeties and so on." Yeah. You know? All right. Make sure you tell them that. Okay. And touchbacks. Make sure they know the difference between touchback. Okay. So that one looks like fine. And then I had to take over the basketball. My job was going to be taking the basketball part and dividing into groups and teams to play basketball. They had eight basketball in that big field house. They had basketball everywhere. That, the Muncie was a powerhouse in those days in basketball. Back in the late 50s, they won championships from 
they were geared in the high school and junior high. Everything was geared to the high school program. Jay McCurry was their head coach, and it was they had a feeder system. They were screening these kids out all the way up and down the line in that big system they had up there at that time. That was very big in Indiana. So it was fascinating how you learn all this. And so I had to get out and gave the presentation on teaching basketball fundamentals for organizing. We rotate among all the groups to make sure they're all actively working, playing against each other in the basket. Got ready and he said, now everything's time now. At a certain time you got to call them clean up. I'm going to get back in the squads and this was in the squads. That was all arranged before we got there. Got ready to blow the whistle. And they were conditioned. He had them well conditioned to whistle. They blow their being stops dead on the spot. You don't argue. And blew the whistle and clean up. Raced back to the squad. They all got in the squads ready to be dismissed. The biggest lesson I ever learned right then. Got them all lined up. Perfect. He's standing just watching. He always squinted his eyes. Both teachers looked there and just beat. They, they taught by terror. Both men that I ended up working with, they scared the dickens out of those kids. They weren't big. The one wasn't a big man, just Mr. Merrill, but he was, he scared them to death. And I said, class dismissed. Big mistake. You don't dismiss 87 students and they had two doors to go out to go to the, take their showers. And as soon as they started running the door, I blew the whistle full. I didn't get, I don't think, 10 steps before I blew the realize the mistake I'd made immediately. Blew the whistle and told them, if I get back in your squads right now, real sharp in the voice. Well, they were still conditioned to hit. They raced right back and got some Squad one dismissed. Walked to that door. He couldn't wait. As soon as the second squad was walking to the door, he rushed over and grabbed him. And he says, now that's what I call teaching. He shook my arm. He said, now that's the best teaching I've seen. And he just praised me just because I made him walk to the gym <laughs> door to go to the PE class to get a shower. I was so scared. I could hardly swallow. I thought I'd lost control of the whole class. 87, I was <laughs> trying to go through that door. Yeah. So then I go to another class and visit the other man, Mr. Ebright. And he taught the graphic arts, which wasn't my strong area, but I studied it and I knew what to do. And so I got in there, and <laughs> the first day I met when they had all these about 20 students in a graphic arts class. Remember the old desks they used to have in graphic arts rooms where they kind of elevated and you sat behind the desk and they had the types and all of that during the size of the types and stuff. You get the drawer of the drawers and they organize the typesets over here. And then if you the old fashioned machinery, put them in a loading and print station area, you could do silk screen printing and things of that sort, and only block carving, that kind of thing. And they set the type and print off some little stationery and whatever they were going to do. And the first day he meets his class, he looks at all of them, he's about six foot two, and he was a big man. He squinted his eyes just like the other man, and he just didn't say a word, just looked at him. And at that time, there were a number of uh, black students in, in the program in Muncie, which is quite a, an area. And they were mostly, they were guys, not, not They were all the way out to know, they are all, all young boys. And they were all sitting and fighting on their stools. And he had a little table about four or five foot long with a drawer on the side. Okay, he looks around the class and said, this is our student teacher, Mr. Nerd and Ball State, he'll be here. And he introduced me. And I walked toward the table very slowly. And I said, boys, he says, once in a while, we have students who get ants in their pants in this class. And he says, now, I've got a device here that takes care of that. And he slowly, he backed this out, very, pulls his drawer very slowly. He reaches in this drawer, and now they're all watching very intently. This is their first day they ever met this man. He takes this huge paddle out of the drawer. And he says, now, if anybody gets ants in their pants, what we do is we kill them. And he takes that paddle and comes down and hits that table as hard as he can. Well, I've never seen students shoot off of chairs. Like I, I've heard the story people would do that. They physically did. They just literally catapulted up off those chairs and shaking. Okay. And he said, we're not going to have that in this class, are we? And they're all shaking their heads. No, no. They were petrified. And that's the way he taught that class. I mean, like I said, both men terrorized their students. They literally did. So I went to the other man's house. I had the PE class, Mr. Merrill, that did the class. And I went to visit his metal sheet metal class where they're supposed to hammer out things and make things. And if the students were trying to hammer on metal to shape it, you know, if they hit a little bit too hard, they looked to see if you hit it too hard, so you just stare at them. And you can't imagine sheet metal fast without making some noise, a little hard to do, you know, to shape your metal. So, right. But boy, he'd stare at those kids and just watch. They didn't make peeps, they were scared to death. And I never, he was such a, con contrary to everything I had ever been taught at Paul State about how you warmly greet your kids and pat them on the back or whatever, if you give them a hug, you're gonna do in those days. And, <laughs> it was just totally different. I, I learned a lot about organizational skills from them, no question about it. I also learned not to terrorize my students, which I never did. It was a learning, big learning experience. It was a great group. shock. And I, I, I wanted to give a demonstration, and, and I was told with Ball State and Lloyd, we'd like to give you a demonstration. 
in the silk screen printing. You know, they said, I have to have, you know, I'd like to have students gather around, as I was taught at Ball State, have them gather around so they can see where things are taking place. I said, so I talked to Mr. Allen, he was my supervisor, I said, you're suggesting that I have these students get off the stools and gather around the table to see it. That's right. I said, then you better talk to Mr. <laughs> Ebright, because he doesn't want to talk about those stools. They're, they're on those stools, they're there, the class is over. So if I'm to do this, it's going to be interesting, because my grade depends. I said, who, who makes the finalization on my grade? Well, he's going to do that. I said, well, you better do the same with that, because he isn't going to like this at all. I can tell you right now from what I've seen so far. So I said, I'll take care of that. So, okay. So I went out of frozen medicine. I'd like to have the students of the stools go. Oh, yeah, fine. It's going to be total chaos. You know, that was his first reaction. They behaved beautifully. It wasn't a problem at all. And I had them gather around the table, and they were thrilled to death to be able to move for a change rather than be glued to those to the stools. And right. They got down very quietly and very obediently stood around there to demonstrate the silk screen printing to the boys, and everything worked like they were making a big Muncie Bearcat on t shirts, so I had to show them how to do the silk screen and so on. But it was quite an experience. You really had some experience. I had some, I right. had real eye openers when I got out. I it felt, sounds like it. I felt well prepared for what could happen. I didn't know where I was going to help me teach. You were prepared for the line. Oh, it was. It was interesting. <laughs> it was very uh, interesting. A wonderful well, experience. So yeah. I, I loved it. I really loved it. I loved it. Ball State was my home. It became my home because my mother died the very first quarter I was in college. She went home that weekend and then right before Thanksgiving. First quarter in college, she managed to get health and come home. But she had a bad heart for all these years. Only 45. So we go home for Thanksgiving. As soon as I arrived at the house, I see she was in bad shape. You know, couldn't breathe. Filling up with water in her lungs. I rushed to the hospital Friday that night, Friday, Friday night, she was dead Sunday. And that that turned my whole thing upside down. So to me, my whole life was over. You know, as I had grown up and known that we had our own home, which Dad had built, and uh, it was, you know, I had a wonderful, wonderful home up to that particular period of history. And, uh, so that, in reality, we moved in with my aunt, his sister in Frankfurt. And moved there and sold the house in Mulberry. I said, You might as well sell it. That isn't home anymore. And he said, Then he got out of the business. He sold the salon of business. It wasn't going to go anywhere. He realized that. And so he sold the business. And uh, we moved to Frankfurt and became a justice of the peace in Frankfurt for many years and also worked in a department store. We lived with my aunt then while I was in college. So college to me was more home than, than coming sure, back living right. with, with my aunt. Right. And uh, that was really was home. And right. I, but when I go, I go back to campus, he would come home on the weekends and rest. And, and, uh, but it was just. I couldn't wait to get back because I felt so comfortable with the people that I lived with, yeah. and uh, it was wonderful. Let's talk a little about after that. Then, what uh, after you finished? Were after you in the finished, military at all? In the military? I've been in ROTC oh. for two years when okay. I first got there. Air Force ROTC didn't pass the upper division physical exam. You know, as a PE major and special arts teacher, I had bad legs, which I had all my life, and uh, got that from my mother's side of the family. I inherited uh -huh. very close veins at those times and bad feet, flat feet. But I was in the military for two years, but then you have to take an upper division physical to get to the upper junior, senior year, well, I didn't pass the physical. And so then I thought, man, I'm going to be drafted. So they were still drafting people with the Korean War at that point in 52. So I got out of ROTC and the courses. And strangely enough, once I was out of that, my grades went up immediately. I, I, I learned one thing about myself. I would not have been a very good military man. I just wouldn't have. I, I was older than a lot of the young people over there at the time. But I, I'd stayed out of college a whole year before I went to college. So I was, that extra year had matured me a great fussy injury. I think all together those things helped mature you a great deal. I was just so thankful to be there in college and so glad to have the opportunity to go to college, not knowing whether I'd ever make it or not. Go through college. Yeah, finally so being there. Just thrilled, and, and right. I knew Louise was going to be a fine student. If I wanted to marry her, I had to go to college. I knew that because her parents expected her to get a degree and, and get her teaching, and that was a big draw. I, I could not had she not gone, you know, been going to college, I wouldn't have gone. You know, that was the situation. She was able to go together, which we did. We went all through four years of college together. Then we got some, some, we graduated in, in 54 and, and got married that June. And I didn't go apply for a job. She had a job lined up in Frankfurt, which is close to her home. Her parents lived out in Frankfurt on the sure. outskirts. And I fully expected to be drafted. So I didn't apply for a job and uh, took the physical examination and, and uh, didn't pass the physical. But, and they were taking everybody yet. And, but the lady in Frankfurt told me at the draft board, she says, my mistress. He says, I've heard that if you want them to give you a thorough examination when you go to get to your examination, if you have any, anything that seriously needs to be considered and examined specifically, you need to have a doctor's note saying so, or you won't, they won't take your word for it. She said, and she was an old lady, and she said, I'm very kind. She yeah. said, no, that's just what I've heard, because they're not supposed to play high school. It's just, I, that's just some things I've happened to hear, so you might want to think about that. And I thanked her, and so I went down to 
Lafayette and Dr. Gary used to be with Dynamo Clinic and, and uh, where Dr. Harshman also was when he fixed my face up. So I met with him, met with him and he took a look. He'd just gotten back from Mayo Clinic and just had varicose vein surgery himself. Well, the timing couldn't have been better. So I came back, took one look at the leg, oh my goodness, how long have you had that? I said, since I've been 18, 19 years old. And it was getting worse and worse all the time. And the, the, the guy in the army said he'd never seen anything like it. And uh, he said, well, he said, I'll be glad to write a note because he said, you're, you know, there's no way you can do basic training. He said, the first thing they're going to do is they have to operate. They aren't going to want to do that. They want to put you in service and send you off. They don't want to operate right away. He said, there's no way you can do it. I said, no, I, I learned that at Ball State. I could had to take swimming classes, all the PE classes. You have to take everything, gymnastics, you know, all the whole thing. And in swimming, my leg cramped all the time. And I had to get out of the pool. It was a big knot in my head. So I knew I was having trouble with it then. So, but he said, wait until you're in your 30s before you have the surgery. You know, it's not going to be the best thing, but he said, just wait until then, because then your skin won't be such a problem. that You still catch it in time to go up. It'll be easier to do the surgery. And you should be able to make it to that point, although it's bad. But he said, I think you'll be all right. So I took his advice, and luckily enough, it worked out. And. Uh, but I did not get drafted, so my wife had a job in Frankfurt at the Kiger Elementary School. And I came back from taking the physical exam. There was only two people that didn't pass it. And one was a young man who was growing up in our little town in Mulberry who had never gone to school because he was illiterate, couldn't learn. And, and his sister was in my wife's class, a nice young man, but just, you know, just handicapped, mentally, physically hand, mentally handicapped. He worked with his dad the farm as best he could. Still living to this day, I believe, although he's in a nursing facility. We were the only two that didn't pass, and I was the healthiest looking specimen of the bunch. And because the guy in front of me had lint glasses so thick he couldn't even see the eye chart. And so when they covered his eye to check him out, he says, take your glasses off. And he told the man, sir, I can't see. No, so you don't say that to military people. He found out as we were all standing there. So, all right, so he covered his eye, and he's going like this. And we were could keep it in. We were all laughing on our face because he, he was searching, trying to find the wall. He couldn't even see the He said, well, sir, read this. And he's trying to find, finally he found something up there that said, it looked like an E, and finally he said, E, and that's all he could get on one name, clever the other eye, and he got E and two letters in the middle, and they took the poor fellow, drafted him. I couldn't oh. imagine what they would do because he was a, he was nearly a, as serious a handicap as I've ever seen. Oh, right. So I came back home, told my wife, I said, well, and she was upset, we'd only been married a few months now. I said, I did, been married in June, this was in August of 26th. I said, I didn't pass it. I didn't pass the physical. She said, that's nothing to kid about. I said, I'm not kidding. I didn't pass the physical. 4F, I got this. In fact, I had the guy go back to verify when he said, you're 4F. I thought, I misunderstood the name because they were taking everybody else. And when I got ready to go home up there, I asked the person, I said, would you verify that? I said, I think the man said, I'm 4F. Well, I'll check. He said, what in the world's wrong with you? <laughs> he couldn't. He looked to be kind of funny. Like, what's wrong? <laughs> I looked healthy enough at that point in my life. So. Sure enough, he gets back. He says, "You're right. You're full around." So we went out, went to the Clinton County Fair that night, and lost the car keys. <laughs> had to get my dad to come out and bring that set of keys out. That's how we celebrated it. So then I got on the phone the next day and said, "Well, I'm available to teach." And I called Ball State and had them activate my file. Said I'm available for teaching. Was it was late? I know the school started in September the second, I think, or fifth at that time. And so. As a result, uh, I called them and I said, well, I might as well call Purdue. We're living in Frankfurt now with our apartment. So I called Purdue and uh, told them to activate the file. I said, I, I said, I don't graduate, but I said, I'm available to teach. I just got turned down for the service. He says, this is the operator, not Purdue. He says, what in the world's wrong with you? This is Purdue. This is the old-fashioned operator. And I said, well, I had a health issue, and they turned me down. So nobody's turned me down. I said, well, I know. I'm just I can look at it fortunate or unfortunate, but I'm looking for a teaching position. What are your areas? So I said, industrial arts, physical education, health and science, driver's ed. And I, taking courses in all those areas. You say, just for But well, just a minute. It just so happened that Bill Floyd from West Lafayette put a phone call in to Purdue right at that moment and said he needed industrial arts teacher, and science teacher, and health teacher, and PE. The very, he said, just a minute, just a minute. Did you say industrial arts, sir? Yes. I've got a man right here. So if you just plug me, switch me right to Bill Floyd at that. You talk about timing is everything in life. It really, truly is. So he passed me right to Bill Floyd, and uh, my father-in-law had known Bill Floyd because he'd been to Frank Frankfurt, and they knew and had known each other at that time, way back then. He was then. a superintendent. He was, yeah, for years. So he asked when could I come down. I said, when would you like to be there? I can be there any time. How about two this afternoon? So I'll be there. So I turned down from service one day on, on Thursday, and I went down to West Lafayette, senior high school, and the superintendent Floyd, and signed the contract. 
I would take pennies at that point just to have the job. I said, I can drive back and forth, which I did um, for a long time, in fact. But, uh, that's how I landed the job in the West Lafayette Junior High School system, which was a gold mine. I didn't know that at the time. Sure. And it was so irony, it's so ironic because uh, Dean Nelson, who became the dean of the school at Paul State later on, told me, he said, when you, get, when you graduate, try to find a school that's really run down, that's large for them, it's just really in bad shape, because anything you do is going to make you look great, boy. <laughs> and I thought, when I walked in and saw the facilities that they had at that time, I thought, boy, a truer word couldn't have been said, because I'd <laughs> had to go out and visit schools and write programs, write reports on what I saw in the various industrial arts facilities around the state at that time. And when I saw this one, I thought, oh, man, this is right out of the horror book. We're down in the basement, which they usually were, with all the heat pipes going through the pipes at the top. What well, could be better? Oh, it couldn't have been for better. Renovation. Tools, oh, it was. The tools were all in the drawer. They put the, the teacher they'd had had been a science teacher at the high school, and they hoped he'd quit. He wouldn't. So they sent him down to the junior high school to teach shop, which he knew nothing about. That wasn't his preparation. He was an older man, and they were hoping he would quit so he could just get rid of the program for him at that time, which he refused to do until he was a, later on in life, age wise. And so and the students just. I guess didn't like him. At least they told me they didn't. When I took the job, I found all these things out from the students. They couldn't wait. They put tax on his chair and all kinds of things. And so he got so angry with him. He bolted all the, the drafting tables looking toward the window so he didn't have to look at the students. And bolted them to the floor so they couldn't move their tables around so they couldn't move anything. Just bolted them all to the floor. So, the, so I go to raise the window that hurt them in the facility. And the whole door jam, the window jumped right out of my arms about the termites had eaten the whole side of the jams and of course the building was condemned for three years. We were waiting to get a new building at that time and they'd already been condemned and all the tools in the facility were in drawers, the planes and shaped the little tri-squares and triangles and all other kinds of tools and chisels and anything, all just thrown in a drawer. I found a beautiful lathe buried under a pile of wood under the stairwell, which you're not supposed to do. It's illegal to have any wood under a stairwell at school or fire firehouse. There were so many fire hazards in that room. So the first thing I had to do was repair all the equipment to get it so it operate, which I did. I had some students help me, but they enjoyed doing that in the fish pen. So I built a tool panel and mounted all the tools so we could see what we had and got things organized. And took the one lay that had out that wasn't any good and took the one out of the buried on the wood pile and fixed it all up, which I took Will Allen's class from maintenance and repair and we learned how to do all those things. So I took it apart and fixed it all up and made that one work. We had a good lathe from that point on. So it was just a, but it was a great opportunity because like, sure like Dean Nelson, Nelson or, uh, told me, he said, anything you do is going to make you look good, which was true. Right. It did. Right. It, it worked yeah. out really well. Yeah. Well, then you were there for a while, quite so a while. Well, I lived there for 12 years. Then how did you kind of make the connection uh, to Purdue? And I coached, uh, I kind of, how they hired me, I ended up teaching industrial arts, health and science, physical education. Coached three sports, basketball, football, and track, and little league baseball in the summertime, and I had a summer crafts program. And then I started counseling students on the side. I found out students kind of kept coming to me about it. I was younger than some of the other teachers, I don't know, but they kept asking me personal questions, and I wasn't sure I was getting the right answers. So I, I did not have a counseling degree at that time. So you had to get a master's degree, which was required within five years at that time in our history. And so I ended up going, well, I don't need more industrial arts. I felt I had enough of that. So I decided, well, I'll take an administration license and counseling, and guidance and counseling, and make a dual major out of that with a minor in psychology at Purdue. It was right across the street from where the old school used to be, where the church is now. And that's what I ultimately did. So I ended up meeting a lot of the professors at that time, getting acquainted with them. And at the Purdue was the, uh, the particular the, the building? Old, uh, the building that's where the church is right down here across from Purdue University. Oh, there's, the university where that, there's a church right across the street over here. Right, University and Church. And that's where the junior high school was. I'd been a high school, and then they made that into the junior high. And so I just walked across. We'd take, in fact, I'd I take field that. trips over here and do the leaf studies in my science class. We'd walk around campus and look at how the kids identify the different leaves and so on, trees, and go back to campus within an hour. I had a nice little hour field trip with the site of third class. So I was there and did that for a long time. And then I uh, we changed several principals through the time. Jim Yarning was also a Ball State grad, so we clicked right off the bat, and then Jim went on up the line, went back to Ball State, all of them, became involved with the administration work up there. And then Ken Coger came on board, which is a dear friend to this day, and, you know, we just really clicked. And he was my principal for the number of years I was there until the last year, when Carmen Fabian took over from the elementary and took over one year until we found another principal. Then I left, I decided to leave that particular year, because I, I started having, uh, what really made Purdue, I think, interested in what I was doing was I, I read in a school shop magazine about a program called Research and Development offered at Silver Springs, Maryland, 
Don Maley was a professor in charge of this new program. It was a, a, like a lab school out of Burris and Munson, at Ball State, of course, a lab school across the street at uh, Silver Springs, Maryland. And he had this special program for high school kids. That you could do research and all kinds of experimental kinds of things. And the more I read about this thing in the school shop, and I looked at my program, I was on a bus to a tour to the science museum of science and industry with Bob Curtis, who was our science teacher. And we, he had me ride the bus with the kids while this was a little teaching science. And I was taking the school shop, I took the magazine, was reading along. And I, the more I read about that program, I thought, boy, that sounds just like the junior I have, kids I have here. We've got Purdue right next door, and I've got the same kind of career kids, really sharp, really sharp. And I thought, well, that really fit the program I have right here. So we built a new, they built a new facility over here for the junior high at that time, and it's still there now. And when we moved into that new facility, I started getting some students. I took a course with Dr. Hassel when he first came his first year here, and I had to take a course that summer in, in curriculum development. I'd already got my master's degree in guidance and counseling administration from Purdue, from Purdue Lee Isaacson and uh, Frank Wardhoff were the two professors I had for my degree. And I decided then for every nine hours beyond the master's degree, West Lafayette would put you on another path for more money. And teachers always need money. I'm always, well, that looks like a pretty good deal. So I started taking one class or two during the summer hours. You pick the courses that was complimented what you're doing. The grades weren't that critical. Although it drops out fine anyway, because if you want you to learn how to do that, it's fine. So I met House over and took the first course from him, got an A in the class, along with some of the other graduates who were in the program at that time who were in the, in the department, industrial technology department. And he liked some of the things I was doing, and I, he started sending student teachers over. I had one each semester for the last five years, or that, two, two a year, one every semester. And he was more busy, and I was doing some things, and I, and I started that research and development program. Well, that gained a lot of, no one in the state was doing anything like anywhere around. And so we had an industrial technology conference in Fort Wayne. And I got on the program. Some of the teachers in the district wanted me to present a program at the state from the conference. I said, okay. And so I took four of my top students and their projects they had done on research and development. And I had all kinds of things going on. Well, those students I had, I mean, I, I carefully screened the kids in the program because they had to get up to study hall and I implemented this program. And I get parents' permission to do so because there are no soda. And I took one of the very best students I could get. I went down and met with counselor Jan Turbin, their counselor, met with her, met with the parents, looked at the grades, made sure they're all A students. And I got them in the program. And I think we're willing to do this because they're going to have to go to the study hall and do a lot of research, go to the library, do a lot of study. So I had about five or six students to start the program right to begin with. And boy, they were sharp. I mean, these kids, they were so verbal. And they were, they were great students in every area. I mean, there wasn't a weak spot in any of them, five or four. <coughs> so I took the four and took them up to Fort Wayne Conference. The householder was there. We had a packed room, about 45 or 50 teachers from the state in the program to see what's going on with this thing. And I just presented what we were trying to accomplish in the program, gave the objectives of the program and how it worked, and the fact that there's always students in every school that can benefit from a, from a special research type program who have the ability to do these kinds of things. And I said, I only designed this for the students who have the capability to do that. Not all students are capable of doing the kind of research that I expected them to be able to do. Right. And some of them said everybody should participate, and they, we have big debates over that all through the years. I, I see one way, some people say, and that's okay. But I think, that, I think there should be a challenge for the kids who want to benefit from something like that, and who can. I think that, that sometimes they call it classification of students and they don't like to classify people, but at the same time, not everybody's equal. And some students can benefit far more from those better kinds of things, them. better able to handle it. They're better that. one thing than another. Sure. sure. And why not give them an opportunity to go as far as they can go with it? Why hold them back if they want to pursue that? Was my philosophy with it. And for Ken Porter of all four, he said, I think it's a great idea. Back at, you need any books? I said, yes, get what you need. So I got the books I needed. Bob Kirsten, Curtis gave me a science equipment, so I had microscopes down in the Industrial Arts Lab and I have science equipment, electronics, all kinds of stuff that most teachers don't have in their laboratory. And kids didn't know how to type, but they, one parent wrote the back up the door and brought the kids' typewriter in, so they and then the program gave me school letterheads, so the students started typing out letters, and they'd go up and buy it. Oh, I lost his name. Russ Arthur was our English teacher at that time. And Alice Arthur worked at Purdue as well as a you know, principal at West Lafayette High School later on. So I coordinated the program with Russ on the English part of it. So I'd have the students write letters to industry to get them they want a free sample of the products they were going to do so they can do some comparative research. So the students would write their letters out with what I wanted to put, have them put in the letter, and let them write it out themselves. And then they take it up to Russ Arthur to get approval on the way it was put together and then change it. And so we coordinated the English program. Sometimes they get into math problems. So I worked with the math teachers. So if you have some kind of math, they do some you know, graphs and charts that we're going to make. They need some help with the math, so they'd write the math to what we were doing on the research end of it for those kids. 
And when we went up to the conference then and made that presentation, they had charts and graphs and all the samples of things they'd done there on the research, and it was impressive. Okay. It was impressive. You know, Dr. Hauser at that time came up after and said, uh, that was one of the best presentations he'd ever seen. I said, I, I, well, you got to thank the students because they, they did the work. Yeah, he said, you put it together, you organized it, and give me a lot of credit for that. But that's, that's how we got acquainted with what was going on in the, in the industrial technology part. And um, then I had, had a student teacher then every semester, therefore, after that. And uh, got several recognitions, and he saw, uh, got some recognition for the thing that we were doing, and he received some recognition from that, some awards from the other, what we were trying to accomplish. And, Got involved in writing things for the state department later on. We changed the curriculum from to the technology type program we now have in manufacturing. When we changed the things, and I had to write the, the curriculum for the state. Then later on, was when they had the research development as a part of the state curriculum for the students, who again it became an elective type program for those. And I had the joy of putting that all together and writing it. And I enjoyed that very much as I put that part of the program together. So, I, but I had a, a very wonderful time teaching. I had. Enjoyed the coaching that I got out of my system. I, I coached for eight of the ten years, or twelve years I was in junior high, and I had to coach football, track, and little league, and, and basketball, which is really what I wanted to coach to start with. And I had some wonderful teams, and, and uh, I had John Free and Free for Hall's father, who was named after John Free Aver's dad. And I had the son of the junior high school, and I happened to have him lucky enough for two years in the junior high school, and I had some fantastic basketball teams with those young kids. And, yeah. It's good to see those kids successful. That's now, right. Yeah. I hadn't seen some here. I've been in Purdue and retired now. One day, it's been, oh, I think two, three years ago, I was walking through the cafeteria over here at, at uh, the NCL cafeteria. Phil Cameron referred to camera construction or whatever industries. And uh, Phil was on my team with John Free for the boy. For two years, I had two years. I moved up from seventh grade and the eighth grade. Coach wanted to go to the high school. So I said, well, I can move up to eighth grade and coach eighth grade. And Bill Flood said, okay, because I had the same kids and I moved up. So I had them two years. And really the only time I had the opportunity to do that. And as you all know, in teaching, when you have a group of kids two times, work with them two years over a period of two years, they know you, you know them, and it's a big advantage. Yeah. And so when I moved up with that eighth grade team, they went unbeaten. And we went 28 over a period of three years, went 20, 28 straight games over a period of three years with the different teams I had, and that was fun to do it. But I got out of my system, then we had a family, and when I had a child, child before a son game, then I began to lose interest in coaching. <laughs> Louise needed help at home, I needed to be home, I got, I was torn. I wanted to coach, but I didn't want to coach anymore. Yeah. I, I want to be with my son now, and, and so that's when I decided to get out of coaching completely. Okay. Now, talk a little about when you were, how you came to Purdue, and then uh, okay. your experiences there. After 12 years at uh, junior high school, one summer I, I uh, had a, a summer crafts program, they call it every summer, with kids from fifth, uh, five, oh, fifth grade to probably seventh or eighth grade and they at, the high school. at the junior high and they take that crafts program for six weeks and just let me all kinds of things and uh, that's what I've been doing during the summer because there were no job for teachers in the summertime and that's we're, we're hard up on money in those days you know right. so I was during the final year I was at the junior high school Bill Sargent who's now the department head of Ball State at that time uh, I've been back and made some presentations and some programs up there was my alma mater, and uh, he was impressed with some of the things I was accomplishing. And he, he said, "No, we have that mass production unit." He said, "I want to come down to the state supervisor of industrial arts. I want we want to come down and spend the day with you, see how you do this." So he came down. I called him over. We're getting ready to start next week. Okay, we're coming down. So he drove down to Ball State, and the guy from Indianapolis. And they met down to industrial arts and spent the whole day watching what I'm doing with those eighth grade youngsters in the mass production unit. We moved the machines all around and got them in assembly line order. So that one kid did this, another one did that, and passed the parts. We had our own production system worked out. And I uh, had the students explain what we were comp trying to do, and, and he spent the day watching this program, went back and really impressed, so I told him no more about it, everything went fine. And I'm getting all signed up, signed up to teach the crafts program again, same as usual. And I got a call at home, he said, well, it's Bill Sargent, Paul State. And I said, how you doing, Bill? Fine. I want to ask you something. What's that? He says, how would you like coming to come teach for us this summer? And you guys, you know, I'm a junior high school teacher. And he says, yeah, we'd like to come over to the Burris Lab School and teach you whatever you want. Just do something different than woodworking. But just come up there and, and do some of the things you're doing on West Lafayette. I started a plastics program, which nobody had in the state of, at that time. And, and so I had this plastics and production, mass production unit and other kinds of things, so I had a lot to do that. And so I'd like to teach the Burris Lab program and also teach a graduate course over at the campus for elementary teachers. But if you want to teach that course, can you do that for us? And I also scheduled a surgery in my leg that summer at the same time at Mayo Clinic, but I said, well, I could be there for part of it. I wouldn't do the whole thing. That's water time you can be here, what he told me. So I said, well, I'll talk to my wife. I said, 
see if I said who is it. Well, it starts from Ball State. I said, what does he want? He wants us to come to Ball State. He wants me to teach two courses, one at the Burroughs Lab School, and, and then teach a the graduate course one I'm going to teach it this morning on campus. So that was quite nice. And I said, we're going to make it worth your while. But don't worry about it. You know, he told me what he's going to offer me. I said, whoa. <laughs> it's sure a lot more than I was making this <laughs> teaching a pass program, $300. It was substantially more. And I said, we can do that. I have to find a place to stay. And so I got on the phone right away after I accepted the job and called. I found my the former landlady who's still up there, close to 90 now. I called her on the phone because I stayed with her off campus. I moved off campus for the last two years there and really loved that. And they just took me out of the way. I was the oldest student in the, in the third time. You only had four boys. I was one or two in the front room, two in the back. And my cousin was in college now, and so he was in the other room joining mine. So the two of us were, had known each other in childhood, of course. So the two of us were in that part of the house, and the two other boys in the front. So I called her on the phone. She's still living. She says, where are you? I hadn't talked to her in 12 years. And she says, where have you been? Well, I've been a little bit busy. And she says, well, you didn't get in touch with me. And she kind of chewed me out for not getting back in touch with her. But I said, well, I got a request. I said, do you have to have a room available for my wife and I? And I've got a little son now. And they brought me to teach up here this summer. I sure will. I, mean, I won't be the same room you had before. But she says, I'll, you can have the front room. I said, that'll be great. Well, I look forward to it. So we spent the summer up there. And that's what it is. So I'm teaching the program. I love it. I had a great time teaching those kids at the Burroughs Lab School and the Ball State. And all my teachers it was really a lot of fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. And it was in the third or fourth week I'm up there and I got, got a call from Purdue. I picked up, I just got home from teaching that morning, got a call from Dan Housel on the phone. And he said, Lloyd, yeah, Dan here at Purdue. I said, how are you doing? He said, how would you like to come and teach for us? I said, well, you got a night class or something? What do you have in mind? No, this is a full-time position. No, I'm pausing. I said, you, you're offering me an opportunity to come and teach. I won't be coaching or doing anything like that. No, no, this is a full-time teaching at Purdue in the industrial, arts, industrial education department. Hmm. I'd already signed the 13th contract for Bill Floyd. And I'd already signed that. And I said, well, I've got to give that some talk. Dan, I'll let you get back with you. I said, okay. I know it's kind of sudden, but we've got an opening. I said, it'll start this, it'll start this fall. This is the summer of 66. So I got off the phone, and he says, who's that? I said, Dan Houser of Purdue, why do you want to do this? He's offering me a job at Purdue. You're kidding. I said, no, he's offering me the job. <clears throat> and so now I'm, I, I'm quandary. I love what I'm doing. I always wanted to teach junior high school. From day one, that's when I got out of high school and decided when I wanted to commit myself to teaching. Where do I want to go? High school, junior high, I don't know, whatever. I'm going to junior high school. Most people don't like junior high school kids. I love them. Most people don't like them because they're between one minute and an adolescent, next thing a little bit kid, and they're vastly. And I like that change with kids. So that turned out to be a real challenge. I said, I'd get back with him. I waited a week. I still hadn't gotten back trying because I knew I had to go for a doctorate degree because at that time you had to have a pursuit of not in a regular school of technology. You did not have to have a doctorate. But it, since it was tied to teacher education, then you have to have a doctorate because industrial education is a part of the education department, which I never knew for a long, long time. They're tied together part of my salary at that time was being paid by the education school, part by the school of technology, which I never knew for many, many years, not until the last five years within the department, believe it or not. I didn't know that. So after one week, he called me back. Mary of mine, I said, no, I haven't. I bought it. got a shot. And I said, I didn't know what a phenomenal opportunity this was turning out to be at the time. I really did. And I said, there's a lot to think about. I've got to pursue a doctor. He said, that's a big challenge. I said, I didn't think I'd forgot my master's finish and all those extra courses I had to do any more college work. I really wasn't looking forward to going any more of that kind of thing. But it's it a burden on the family. Got into my boy was a little ill on his asthmatic condition, that made it a little bit difficult. So I said, uh, I promise I'll give you word by next week. Okay. So we left and I went out and went out and talked to her father, my wife's father. And he'd known me from first grade all the way through, my strengths and weaknesses all the way through the whole thing, whether I could handle it or not. We talked for quite a long time. And he said, well, you're not the same person you were when I had you back in school. <laughs> when I had you in algebra, he says, you're not the same person. He said, you've changed a lot through the years. You've had a lot more experiences. And he said, I, I had the opportunity to go to Indiana State one time. And he said, I, I didn't take it. And he said, I regret it all. He'd have been a great professor at the collegiate level. He knew the math and physics kind of thing beautifully. He had done very well with it. 
And so I always regret I didn't take that opportunity. He says, you've got the situation where you've got a life license. You taught long enough in Indiana, 12 years now. So you've got a life license. Yeah. And if you said, if you find out every year you listen to what you want to do, and you don't like it, you can always go back to public school because you've been around long enough. You've already, you've already established the things you can do. He says, I think you ought to take it. He says, I think you can do it. He says, I really think you can do it. And I said, well, I'll look into it. I'll, think, I'll go ahead and I said, it's your call, whatever you do, I'll support you. He said, if you want to take the opportunity, take the chance, then that's fine. So it was a big gamble because you're gambling that you pursue a doctorate and get it done. Not only pursue it, you have to get it done. Right. If you're going to have an opportunity to advance or do anything else on the campus. So that's how it happened. I went back and called him and said, I'll take the job. And he came out and explained all the things to me, like the salary and everything else. And uh, with all the fringe package, I was looking ahead to the fact that the fringe benefit package that was get your basic salary, but then all the other things by along to it, your insurances and retirements and all those other packages, really, that was a convinced as far as salary was concerned. The initial salary wasn't going to be that much greater than what I had for uh, the junior yeah. high. The years. fringes have always But the fringe been. benefits were phenomenal. And, the, and the opportunity to work in a first-class institution and uh, all the perks that come with that, which I didn't realize at the time, so many things would come along, and, and it was the best, one of the best decisions I made was to, to accept the position. I loved every minute of it. I really did. I, some people don't understand the opportunity they have. And they, they, to me, it was just a golden sure. opportunity when I accepted it. And I was well received and jumped right in teaching. And I had a lot to learn, a lot to catching up because I had not prepared for that level of teaching. Right. But uh, I, my sole responsibilities were in the industrial arts section of teaching at that time because we had vocational side and industrial arts side. And I was always prepared on the industrial arts side, and I had not had much experience with vocational education at that time. Later on, I did a lot of work with them. I ended up teaching part of the vocational courses as well. Good courses off campus and so on. Time went on. But for the initial, oh, 8 to 10, well, more than that, probably 15, 20 years on, my work was in industrial education, as far as department, writing curriculum, teaching courses from beginning woodworking to metals, to plastics, mass production, methods courses, electricity, electronics, fluid power, power mechanics. Uh, I even had an adult refinishing course for adults, so they wanted to do it. And Ken Coleman, I think it was, asked me. Did uh, on the enrollment? Did you have uh, were there more was more diversified as over time? We had primary in terms of diversification in terms of men and women. Mm -hmm. When I came, we had almost all. I don't think it was a female in the program. I recruited a lot of them later on. Sure. By the time I came, we didn't have any, and uh, we did branch out a lot. And I recruited quite a few from the humanities department into our program, and they loved it. And we got good jobs. And ironically enough, some of them have even received teaching awards teacher education in Indiana. And one young lady went to Illinois and got her picture in the paper in Illinois. And the first female teacher ever hired in school and she sent them paper back to us. And made, she made the front page of That's her paper great. and made her thrill her to death. Yeah. Sam, her name was Sandy and Angelo. Uh, first the department was changed to industrial technology Correct. and industrial arts. Correct. Um, but you did a lot of counseling. You mentioned I like counsel for the full 25 or 30 years I was there. Was a full -time took care of their internships and I what started. Did they have a co-op program? They didn't when I started. Started, but I did. I uh, got one started. Oh, okay. I met with the uh, fellows in the, the chemistry department. Uh, I think his name is still head of it. That is that part of the co-op program. So I worked with him on it because we didn't have a lot of programs. Did have co-op? We did. We had a in summer internship program, but we didn't have co-op. And I had students who wanted to do some co-op work, so I worked with him on it, and uh, we got it started. And I had five or six students participate in co-op, both male and female, participated mm -hmm. in the co-op program. And they landed a great job. One, uh, Lauren Gradle, was the first one I had. And one was coming down to Columbus, Indiana. They, uh, they hired it when I got through. I was still there now. It's been years and years ago. <laughs> but uh, it was the first one they had that took uh, the job. And, the right <laughs> so I had and the then, to do that. And then they went to a, they have a graduate program there. Do they now? We had a doctorate program. Originally, we had a math, the, the bachelor's and doctorate in, in our program for a long time. Later on, we lost the, uh, the doctorate. You know, it was years later. I was there in many years before they pulled it out. Took it away when they did. Didn't, they said we didn't have something. I forgot what it was. Oh, so we okay. didn't qualify for it. No, through the, the ability to give the doctorate. Later on, now the, the school has changed. Now we have a doctorate. Master we didn't have okay. a package again. Okay. But the um, school has changed now considerably. One of the groups that uh, the, your department was involved in was that United that uh, United, United Association. Just make a comment right. on that. That was a, been going for quite a while. for a long time. We were teaching plumbers and pipe fitters and teaching them, preparing them to be teachers of the trade. They didn't have. They knew. They knew how to be a welder or whatever. They were quite skilled in plumbing and things of this sort, but they didn't know how to teach it to anybody else. And so if they participated in over a five-year period, they would get a certificate. 
They had to come for five, each summer? Each summer for five years okay. and ten years, and then they got a certificate of graduation ceremony and they got a certificate they're qualified to be a trade teacher. That's what it amounted to. Right. And whatever it was they wanted, they could be welding, it could be plumbing or fixing, whatever. And I taught all the methods and taught methods in that, how to be a teacher. My job was how to give a demonstration, which I've done for many, many years. That was the area I had to teach them. Yeah. And they had to get up in class and actually give a live demonstration. And that was fun to teach those fellows who weren't familiar with teaching and how to teach them all the things about in a short period of time and, and do and that. Five weeks is not too That's long. not very long. We wouldn't have for one week. We had for just one week. So you had to teach them to be a... The five them, years for the one week. Five, yeah. Right, that's what it was. Yeah, it was one week for five years. Yeah, and they already got their cert certificate. But that was a real challenge, a lot of fun. I met a lot of great people, just really great people in that program. What was the age on most of them? Oh, gosh, they ran all the way up into the 50s, some of them. And uh, some of them were young, fellas in their 20s, but a lot of them were up in their 50s, 40s, 50s. Been in business a long time. Oh, yeah, from all over the spectrum, all over the spectrum. But it was a very successful program. And uh, Dr. A had coordinated that for years. And uh, what caused it to be pulled out, the university itself was having a, some work done, and they had they they didn't understand, the union people don't understand how colleges operate, universities operate. And they will only go if, where unions are recognized and where the work being done is done by union people. And they were doing a whole lot of work that year at Purdue, and they were, not, they were that had hired out to non-union people. And that upset the head of the union of the UA, United Association of People, and said, if they don't do that, we're not coming. And Dr. A tried his best best to get that changed and they would not change. So, and so they, we lost, they, they pulled the program up to Michigan or Michigan State, I forgot, I think Michigan oh. State or somewhere. They've been, they've been coming here for a long time. Oh, they've been here for 20 some years yeah, and so it just about, yeah. it, oh, it just ruined Dr. A. That was his baby. He'd been solely responsible for that program from the very beginning. Right, right. And, uh, but that's what actually happened with it. Yeah. The last few years I was in the program here, but Dr. Carroll, before his death, had uh, asked me if I'd be interested in, and I'd been supervising student teachers and so on for a long time the last few years. And he asked me if I'd like to call him one day. He said, you got a minute? And I meant two hours later, always. And he said, no. I want to start a industrial distribution program. He said, I wonder if you'd like to be interested in heading that up. I said, what is it? I have no clue what he's talking about at this point. Well, he said, I've got something I, I've read about it, and I think we've got the kind of program, and I think you're the kind of person who might be able to do something with that. It's brand new. He said, I have another person involved, and he says, Tim doesn't want to get involved with it. He said, I want you to go to Eastern Michigan University and make that program up there with Demo Stavros and see what you can find out about it. And uh, he says, take your wife. I'll take care of it. Just take out care of it. I'll you meet the people up there and go through and find out all about it. And I said, okay. So I made arrangements and called the people up in Eastern Michigan and told them I'm going to be there. And so I drove to Louise and we drove all the way up to Eastern Michigan that day and spent the whole day with them and found out what industrial distribution was all about. And uh, looked at our curriculum that we had, and we weren't very far off, and I looked at what, our, what we call our manufacturing program would be compared to our teacher education program and our manufacturing program. So this would be a third option in reality. Instead of just two, we'd have a third opportunity for students. And when I was up there, Dean most ever said, now there's going to be a consortium of all the industrial distribution programs in the United States, meeting out of Texas A&M. They have the first program ever. Don Rice is the head of out there, and he's got the biggest program in the country. And uh, was only at that time there were only seven or eight colleges in the country that had a program in distribution, industrial distribution. So he said, you'll try to go out there if you can. So I go back and talk to Joe, I got back home. He said, what do you think? I said, well, we're not very far off, Joe. I said, we've got a few things we need to do. He said, they go to grab a consortium out of Texas A&M. And Demo thought I ought to go out there. Good, make arrangements, go ahead, get a plane lined up, and send you out there. Said, All right. So I tried to get a credit card, never had a credit card. Use credit cards, so I, you can't get anything at airports without credit cards anywhere, which I didn't know. So I'm on the phone call all these people. I called the airport out in Texas where the, I saw pay cash, don't take cash. How about a, a cashier's check? You can't do that. He said, what credit card do you have? I said, oh, sir, I don't have a credit card. There's this long pause. He said, why? He said, you don't have a credit card? I said, no, I've never had one. I don't need one. I have something I won't buy it, I don't get it. He says, do you realize how unusual you are? Everybody has credit cards. He says, you, we can't give you a car without a credit card. I said, oh, gee, okay, thank you so much. So I called told Joe, I said, I have to have a credit card, Joe. He says, call Pat He says, I know a person over there, but I haven't had the lady that works down here, Pat at that time, I had her husband in the industrial 
a graduate course in industrial arts for small engine repair and teaching. He was doing methods courses and doing stuff for his course out of McCutcheon High School. And his wife works at the faculty. So I called her on the phone and said, I'll take care of it. I'll walk it through myself and I'll have it tomorrow. Or two days later, I had to she did how she did it. I don't know, but I have a credit card. So I can call back and get her so I could go out and attend this conference. That's the craziest thing I've ever had in my life. So I've had it ever since. <laughs> and uh, yep. so I go out and met with those people and they pick us up there. They have their own van out there and pick us up at the hotel where we're staying. And boy, they treat us royally out there. The ones that are there. And, uh, the college Station. At, yeah, College Station. So I looked over there. Their outline of the courses semester by semester and looked, and looked at ours and I'm like, boy, we're right there. We're right there. All I have to do on that manufacturing program is take out the, some of the electives and plug in the distribution course, a few of the distribution courses that we didn't have. And we're right there, about three or four courses short, and we've got the program, we got a complete bachelor's degree in industrial distribution with just a few modified changes. Everything else is the same. When I looked at it and compared That's it. That's great. So I came back and told yeah. Joe and, and told him where we were. I said, we're only about, we need an introduction distribution. And then we're right there on the program. We're almost there. He says, good. You'll teach it this fall. And this was the middle of the summer, like July. School started, I think, in August. I said, we, we already got the kids signed up for other courses. Joe was out of the counselor and they all signed up classes and so on. He said, yeah, but that's okay. We, we, we'll put that first course there for this fall. And we'll, we'll, we'll get an introduction distribution. Okay. So I had to put that course together in about three weeks to get an outline to get the books. And of course, the demo would give me some material to help and had Don Rice had also material that I would need. And I got on the phone and started calling magazine companies and trying to line up books or whatever I could and just get them rushed in as quickly as I could, which I was able to do. Put the first course together and I had to write all, all the, almost all the courses for the next several years. I had to write different courses and add to it as we built the program and got it approved and talked to uh, uh, Roy Johnson. I got it ready. I said, we're ready, Joe. I'm going to talk to Roy and see if we can't get a dual major, double major. We don't know. So I went over and talked to Roy, and I'd known him for a long time, good friend, and a lot of dealings with him. I presented the program I had in mind. I said, I'd like to make this a double major, dual major program, because if you look at the similarities right there, they can take the choice of this or that. Of course, unlike even one's required in the other, so it's back and forth. So you had really had a dual major. Hmm. He looked at that study there for a long time because it had never been done before on campus. I'll approve. He says it's the only one. I've never seen anything like it. He said, You're right. It, 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 it fits with, with all of it. And it's still on the books to this day. They almost oh, got rid great. of it. But that was one of my greatest feelings to get yeah. that put through because as a result of that, we really got a lot of students. When I left in 66, we had 100 students in the program. And I had a job waiting for every one of them graduated. That, the last year, I, I met, set up my own program with the people who came in to interview them. I had an office next door. And we used that and let the industries come in and interview the students right next door. And boy, I had students lined up. They were interested in wanting our students. That was the big, one of the biggest thrills I had. They were wanting our people to come. They said they, they were so impressed with the way our students went through the interview process. And I counted those kids. I, I had to teach them how to shake hands, how to greet people. They haven't been taught these things. Parents don't teach your kids these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Sorry. They don't know how to shake hands. They don't know how to look people in the eye. And they don't know when to, to listen. And so I told them ahead of time, and I said, when you walk in, you know what you're going to say. But I said, wait until they ask you the question, and they just answer the questions, and then go with it and see what happens. And I had several employers come back after and said, we love to come here because your kids are so great. They really do a wonderful job on the interview. So we're really proud to hire them. We can't wait to hire them. And they did. They hired them. They got phenomenal pay. My goodness, I couldn't. They were getting salaries and knocking socks off. <laughs> oh, my. That makes you feel good. Oh, it made me feel great. That's right. They yeah. really did. <laughs> Uh, a couple of awards that you got that, uh, uh, let me ask you about the Lloyd D. Nero Scholarship. That was awarded to me, that was given in my name by the Indiana Industrial Distributors Association. When I left, I retired in 96, mm -hmm. they presented it to me at that time and they were awarded to the top students in my name every year since that time. That's very nice. And we have anywhere from two to three students that, uh, each year receive the scholarship. I've gone over and met the students. And is, it for, is it renewable? It's renewable every year. Okay. So, okay. so you, but that was can, but can the same the same student get it more than no, one year? No, no. They year just only. get it one time only. Okay. And it's usually a graduating senior. So I've had several. I've been, uh, I've been, it's been eight, seven, since 96. So I've met, I don't know how many students now. Probably 12, 15 students have received it. Yeah. And then you also got the um, 
Oklahoma Delta Kappa Richard McDowell best I counselor. I did. That was, that was. And then your name should be on the phone. It is still there. That's very good. It's the only one in the school of technology. You know, he's honest. passed away. No, Dick I McDowell didn't know. Passed away. We were in Florida a lot of times. I must have missed that. Uh, last winter. Really? Last spring, we yes, were gone. I didn't know that. Yeah. Nice man. I'd known him for a long, long yeah. time. Good friend. In freshman engineering. Yes. That's right. how I met him. Bill Mason and I went over and met with him one right. time and discussed some things. And you were then the president of the Indiana Industrial Technology Education Association. You probably kept active in it after you I were did president. for a long time. Yeah. Until I got involved in the industrial distribution program, and then I wasn't as active anymore. Sure. But I, all my interest in the last five years had to be toward developing that program and keeping it and trying to build that. And I turned the teacher education part of it over to one of my other staff members at that time. Yeah. But I was in it full time for a long time and loved it. I made a lot of presentations and let's received talk, some more. Yeah, let's talk about family. You have uh, one I child. have a son that works over in Kokomo, lives in Kokomo, works did over in Kokomo. Did he go to Purdue? He did. Got okay. his degree in teacher education from Purdue. And my daughter also graduated from Purdue in teacher education, and she taught for, in Springboro, Ohio, for about 10 years, and uh, until she had her family, and she adopted three boys instead of twins, and, and she had them in their, in their first year at school in the first grade, and uh, she had the two boys, and she had uh, one, his younger brother, came through, and she had both of them, and in the meantime, she'd been fostering because they had found they were having difficulty, couldn't have children, told they couldn't anyway. So they fostered for about seven or eight children, fostered for quite a while. And then they adopted those three boys. And after that, then for some mystical reason, she wasn't feeling very well. She was still teaching. And she hadn't been to a doctor. She tried other kinds of things to try to have a family and was unable to do so. And they said, this is not going to happen. Well, they were wrong. So after she shot out with those boys, and all her paperwork was all done, everything was done, and they, you know, they ended up getting, having their first child. And the doctor said, well, that's a miracle. They had a little girl, Kayla Marie, and uh, two years later they had their second miracle. Again, they were wrong. They said, that, that's it, you'd be glad you <laughs> so fortunate. So now they had five children, so we're grandparents with five within <laughs> a very short time. And uh, she hasn't been teaching them. She works, she has three different jobs. She uh, works in a creative, started a creative memory business. She got involved in that, with, with scrapbooking kinds of things, and has done that, and built the program in, in her business up quite well with that. And uh, it's worked well. And her husband, David, graduated from Purdue also in construction, building construction technology. And he's on with Miller Valentine, which is the large, one of the largest construction groups in the Dayton, Ohio, called the Miller, Miller, Miller Valentine Group. And he's still there. We've been there about 20 some years now. Oh, and that's loves nice. him. They have their own home down there. And then Dan, my son, uh, didn't go into teacher education. He did some jobs and just didn't care for teacher education. He tried it, it wasn't for him. Uh, so he worked with uh, Lowe's company and started out here in Lafayette and then transferred to Kokomo. What company? Lowe's. Oh. And has done very well there. And Good. he's been involved with two or three different departments within the Lowe's and supervises those, as well as the main interest is in the paint area where he has to mix and teach and teach other how to mix the paint. He loves that sort of thing. And he's using his teaching. He said, Dad, I'm using my teaching every day because I'm having <laughs> to, I'm teaching these people how to. He said, They don't know proportions and arithmetic at all. He said, I try to teach them how to mix the paint. He said, Mom. Oh, <laughs> take, a, take a little of this one. Well, I, they look at him like he's out of his mind. He's trying to say, I'm, I'm teaching elementary percentages. At least they have no idea how to mix paint. And he says, I love this. So he's usually he's teaching every day with these people. Sure, right. And he's, he loves it. And his wife, Sandy, works with uh, the uh, Meyer group. And she's worked there for a long time. She did not go to school here. Sure. So, but, uh, very happy with it. And what about uh, retirement activities? Tell us what research is what you're talking about. Oh, since I retired, I have been so busy with so many different kinds of things. Uh, we've done a lot of refinishing of furniture, and uh, did our own, done a lot of our own refinishing of furniture, which I did for years. And did it before we got married, in fact, both of us, ironically enough, she refinished furniture in her home as I did in ours. And we do a lot of that, still do. And the fact the church just recently asked me to do a lot of refinishing for them, some tables, and and uh, we finished a, a table, two tables, one for the pastor and one for the church itself, and, and he has another, another. Uh, solid wall on that table he found that he wants me to refinish for next year. I said, it's too late now. That's the next year's project. And, which, uh, which is around the corner. Around the corner. Yeah. And, and his wife had a couple of things she wanted to redone, so we fixed that up for her. So, and then we do a lot of uh, yard work. We do all of our own yard work with chainsawing and, and fixing up stuff like that. And uh, we just do a lot of redesigning a lot of things on our house, on the outskirts of our house. We do a lot of traveling now, which is what I wanted to do when I left. I wanted to travel and see that we wanted to with a travel group called uh, uh, 
can't think of her name, Brenda Taylor coordinates this top notch tour. There was a name of a top notch tour. She lives in Lebanon. Started out as a bank employee down here at Bank and Trust for years and started taking tours for the bank. And she was so successful with it, she left the bank and started her own top notch tour group. And she's been, for the last 20 years, she's had these tours, takes them all over the, all over the country on the bus. And uh, so we've been, we've done a lot of things like that. We've been out to New York City on a tour and doing the, the White House. And she made a rainbow with the, uh, one of those legislators and they you get arrangements, you can get a special pass so you can actually get a personal tour with your group through there. Otherwise they won't they guide you through but you don't see the thing like you do with the personal explanation. Sure, sure. So she made arrangements for this and I met us there and that was one of the best tours we ever had. And he took us through all the rooms of the White except for the second floor you won't see that, but everything else you can see. I don't know how to do that now because of all the problems we've had. Yeah, right. So we took that one with uh, Washington's home and Jefferson's and, and so we've done, we went out west and uh, took our first train ride uh, on the tra Amtrak, went out west to where they made the, the old Ponderosa. We saw the Ponderosa where oh, Little right? Joe and the Cartwrights all lived, and that's the funniest thing because you think when you see it on television, it's a huge house and lots of rooms and big rooms, and you think the stairways go up to some, it goes to nowhere. <laughs> and it's the biggest shock in the world when you actually get in that front room and you see Little Joe and all of them, where, where the things take place. And, go up and you see the stair going up the stairs and you see them sometimes coming down but it goes to nowhere up there that's and we didn't know that we saw this room and they tell you all about it that's the secret that you don't know that's right so <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting trip that first train ride <laughs> right. and then oh it was ironic because this, we'd never been on a long train ride before just went to Chicago one time with Kathy Turin 13 yeah. I think our best friend there was going up there and visited been on this trip out west we had, I said, well, we're the only way we're going to have, let's do it right, so we had our own personal car. And I was up and just sat in big seats in there and had blankets over them. And I said, well, forget that. A two or three day trip out like that, that's not for the, I said, I want my own car with a blunt sleeper, which we did, and we were so glad we did. Because the other people were miserable. Back aches, complained, couldn't sleep, snoring, oh, it was a nightmare. <coughs> no thanks. And, but they're, I can see why people complain about it the Amtrak service because it, the thing rocks you back and forth. These tracks have been well maintained through the years. And uh, everything was fun. Got out there and went to Reno, Nevada. Got a chance to see what people do and how they throw the money away. And, and it's unbelievable. I had never been to a casino until we walked in and looked. We, didn't, we only found the nickel machine. And I said, when I get ahead of quit, so we put the, what we're going to invest in one pocket while we went in the other. So we're not going to lose anything. And we only, I think I made, I think I made 35 cents or something with nickels and I quit. Louis the same way. We saw people throwing money away, hundreds of dollars. Just, just people are insane when they get in those places. We could not believe this. They are crazy. That's all I can tell you. But we enjoyed the trip out, and then we got back. Got stranded. We were on the way back. We were going to come into Chicago to make the thing loop up there and catch a, the buses back to Lafayette. Well, in the meantime, as we're going across the desert, all around the train slows down to a complete stop. The engineers' hours that we had a problem, and the engineers' time ran out, and they, they can only work so many hours, and they have to stop. So we're right in the middle of the desert, and they stop. Well, off, they stop the Amtrak train dead way, call ahead. They are not allowed to go another mile. As engineers, they have to get permission, and they have to <laughs> drive in another guy with a van to bring out here to the train. We sat in the desert for an hour and a half, two hours out in that hot desert. So they got the engineers of the train. Then when they got there, they weren't allowed to get out until they got authorization saying, now you can get off the train or get on the train. Mm -hmm. Well, in the meantime, our food was going to run out. And people were on medication. We were expecting to be in Chicago at a certain time. So that part of the trip turned out to be a total nightmare until we got to Chicago. And then, of course, now we got in Chicago so late, middle of the night. Well, the people that normally load the luggage on and off the train, they're gone. They've gone home. So Brenda and her drivers had to try, and they just dumped all the luggage off in the middle of, between the two trains up here. In the, in Chicago the train station. Mm. So they have all this pile of luggage out here that they have to sort out and have to take it and try to find out which bus it goes on to get us ready to go. We didn't get back to Lafayette like 3.30 or 4.30 in the morning. Oh people God. were off on their medications because they were expected to be there and the people waiting for them were concerned and they were trying to communicate with them and we had some unhappy people on that return trip. The going out was fantastic and all the things we saw <laughs> but boy the return trip turned out to be a royal nightmare. <laughs> That was one we never will forget, though. It was <laughs> right. very, very memorable. Right. How about an outstanding event in closing the right to share with us? An outstanding Mine. events? An outstanding event in your life? Oh. Be anything that comes to well, mind? Well, the birth of our son. When okay. We wanted to have a child for so long, and we had a similar situation where we weren't sure we could have a family, and finally we were able to have a child, and we had a, our girl, and later on that was one of the major events. 
one of the most significant was just being able to be married to my childhood sweetheart. Going through school with her and being married to her, that was one of the most important things in my life because it turned my whole life around. And I told her that many times, but had it not been for her, none of these things would have happened in my life, without question. Uh, so those were very significant things. Right. And of course, the injury turned my life. Had that not happened, I probably wouldn't have gone to college. So I don't know. So things happen for strange reasons. You don't always understand what they say. It takes time for things to become clear in your own mind as you get older. You see these things a little differently. And you also have to try to take, think them through sometimes quickly to make that decision. And hopefully That's it's the right one. Exactly. That was the thing that, uh, that was another big concern. And then you shared some of those. Yeah. And then when I got the call to come here, do you take that job or do you not take the job? It's a big gamble because That's I had right. to go for the doctorate degree. Uh, you have to get admitted to a program before you can do that. And that right. was a big risk. And I knew those are risks because I knew where my strengths were and also knew my weaknesses were. And uh, luckily enough, Don Gentry went the same way. He went to Indiana University as I did. And uh, luck we went to the same place, I had the same advisor. I didn't know that for later. Yeah. But I had a real fine advisor down there, and uh, it helped a great deal. Right. And, uh, but again, uh, each university setting is different. I, I had taught so many years in public school that all a master's degree where it was now quite old, a lot of it was. And I was afraid, because it was so old, since I had been on 12 years teaching, I, I had more teaching experience in our department than any, any of our staff members. No one ever taught in public school that many years. Some of them taught one or two years, some of them never taught at all in the public sure. school, but now they're teaching at the college level, and I always thought that always seemed strange to me. If you haven't been prepared and haven't taught young people before, how can you teach at the college level telling everybody else how to teach and you've never done in your life? It's not the same. Yeah, right. It is yeah. not the same thing. And I always knew when I was in college classes, I knew immediately who had experience and who hadn't. Oh, yeah, it it, just, it right. comes right out at you. Right. But that, that was something else. It was a, it was a big risk, and uh, I wasn't sure I could do it. Uh, you have to come up with a thesis topic that will work, and you have to find some advisors that will work with you. And I was fortunate that I did, and I never forgot what he told me the first time I met them. And I had a, two advisors been assigned to me that we thought were the right people when I went to IU. And they worked out on a title of paper what the courses I was supposed to take, and they would accept my, most of my courses beyond the master's. They would count those towards my degree. Well, most of the colleges wouldn't have, but they said, well, we would accept it because I had a guidance counseling and psychology were in administration, so they would accept most of those courses, even though they're quite old. And they had a program down there called a readings course that said that you, you can counsel, they met the counselor down there in the, in the uh, education department, he was a counseling head, and my advisor said, why don't you serve in this guy's committee for me? And he said, okay, I never met him. My advisor, we just clicked. I was lucky to find an advisor, and he liked people. You never know. When you, I, I had people down there who'd been there two, three years, didn't have an advisor yet. And I had this two men who I thought was going to be my advisor. Both of them took jobs elsewhere. I had no advisor at the first year. And I thought I had a plan of study that they'd written out a tablet paper, but there's no way you do it. But So I had to go down and find a new one. So I go across the street and I heard about Dr. Kinker. So I went in to meet him. And uh, in the meantime, I'd had a, a class with Dr. Borzak in a, a management court program. And I had to have a proposal of some sort of written out for him in that. So when I went in to meet Dr. Kinker for the very first time, I thought I was right back in the 1920s. A little fellow, wiry fellow. You remember what Ross Perot looks like, that little bit? Direct sort of guy. This is my advisor who walks in there and introduced myself. Immaculate office, everything's neatly organized, perfectly just set up. I thought, man, this is great. Had black shoes, white, like white, black and white shoes on. I hadn't seen those in the 20s. I thought, oh boy. <laughs> but then I had a neighbor who was kind of eccentric, and I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> So, first thing I <coughs> introduced each other, got acquainted, I was eight. I said, okay. First thing I asked, can you write? I said, well, I hope so. Got anything you can show me? I said, I have. I have a proposal I did with Dr. Gorja. Let me see it. Pull that right out. Great. I'll take you on. Just like that. Because a lot of me wouldn't take. And I found right. The big lesson I learned in that first introduction within the first three minutes, and he's right. If a person going to go for a doctor and they can't write, because he's not going to rewrite, he's not going to write your thesis for you. And, you go right. to, you know, and I've seen too many guys get hung up with that sort yeah. of thing. So it was good advice. But because of that, and he was impressed enough, but we just clicked right away. And he set my committee up. And I had a committee formed in less than, less than five minutes. I had my graduate committee put together. And I was in another, another class with a young woman. And she hadn't had, she'd been there two years, still didn't have a committee formed. And she said, she said you got here strong? I said, yeah. How long take it? About 10 minutes. She was stunned. We were in a graduate class together. She could not believe it. Said, "Who do you have?" They were doing it for us. How did you do it? Yeah, how did you do it? That's what she wanted. Just, but he, we just, you know, he was supporting and, and backed me to the hill. It was just a great, great advisor. He read good work on me. He said, "You got a plan of study?" So I, I took these papers out to the other guy that's giving me, 
Oh, he went into a rage over that. Because he was very professional. Everything's done perfectly, you know, and he's like, I said, You lucked out. I right. did. I said, Here's what I have. And he yeah. said, What is that? I said, This is my two highest rated. These two other men I gave him names. And that's all they gave me. I said, Yes. These are the courses they've taken. These are the grades they've achieved. They've done that two or four courses at that point. In closing, any closing comments? I think uh, anything special you want to say? Uh, you really covered a lot, which is great. I didn't know that's what you had in mind. Yeah, I think so. Right. It's been a wonderful experience. I yeah. love teaching at Purdue. I love teaching in general. Right. Yeah. And each step has taken you to the next level. The next level. Next, right the next level is that's right. Say, which is really nice. Yeah, I, mean, I used to think just build on the other one. And, and right. Uh, it's all about the correct choices you make in life, and you right. don't always know, like you said, when you're making those choices, whether it's the right. right choice or not the right choice. You just hope it is. That's right. Yeah. And, and so many times, it's just by instance, by, by coincidence, things happen. That's right. Exactly. For whatever reason, we don't always know why. That's right. That they happen <laughs> Hopefully, the they, they all do. turn out all right. They yeah, are, exactly. Right. And, yeah. uh, but I want to thank you very much well, for this. Thank you. It's I been my pleasure. That. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs>